Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome our next speaker, Sebastian von Eckers from, uh, from the UK. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, potato cyst nematodes, sometimes we call potato cyst nematodes PCN uh, in the UK, and I'll talk a little bit about our work on trying to understand the current state of the problem, uh, and also our sort of search for new control measures uh, in the future. Now there's a lot of people on this um, uh, slide, and even actually more people in the book, and uh, <laughs> some people will know what that uh, group is about, um, and I'll try and point out where these people are involved as we, as we go through this last Okay, so a couple, I think just a couple of uh, brief slides of background. I think a lot of this we sort of already know about potato cyst nematodes in the UK. Um, I think we think they're native to South America, really not too far away from where we are here. And that most, uh, Europe is sort of acted as a secondary distribution point for most of the uh, other potato growing regions in the, in the world. <coughs> we know that the diversity we have in the UK for the potato cyst nematodes is only a tiny proportion of the diversity that's present in South America. But nevertheless, we know we have different groups. So we don't just have one type of potato nematode, we've got different um, populations. And those populations vary in some important characteristics like pathogenicity and things like that. And finally, um, the problem in the UK is these potato nematodes are certainly spreading and it's, it's certainly getting worse. It's not getting better. So I have uh, a couple of slides um, that were provided um, from uh, John Pickup and from Kim Davies on, on how potato nematodes look in Scotland. Um, on the left, you can see Rostock Yensis, and on the right, Paladin. It just shows uh, the change in time over the last 10 years. And actually, um, in, 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 in terms of density, in terms of number of fields that have uh, been detected within, both Rostock Yensis and G. Paladin have increased over those 10 years. Um, but the increase in Rostock Yensis was very small, and the increase in Paladin was considerably larger. This just shows you the, the area of, of fields that have. Uh, have potato cyst nematode again over time, and in general it's increased, um, both Rostockiensis and Pallida, but the increase in Pallida is starting to slow down, and it's the increase in, 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 in sorry, the increase in Rostockiensis is slowing down, and it's the increase in Pallida which is the most worrying, uh, this kind of, uh, what looks like an exponential growth curve is really, really uh, scary. In England it's much the same problem as in Scotland, so I'll be much more brief on this, these are data provided by Cassia and, and, and Matt Bank. Uh, again, just showing um, for uh, over time from year 2000 to 2016, um, mostly it's an increase in, 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 in Paladin. And this map, I quite like these maps, they show you the, the colors show the density of potato growing regions, and the dots show you where is the, uh, either Rostopiensis or Paladin. And basically, wherever we have the most potatoes is where we have the most nematodes. Yeah, so it's not really this one. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today are two things. Uh, the first one is the state of the problem, if you like, or our work to try to understand the state of the problem in the UK. And so this is really, uh, you know, looking at where we are now, what different types do we have of these nematodes, where are they, and in what proportions. And then the second part is really the search for control measures. So really, you know, in the future, quite distant future, how might we be able to understand enough about the nematode biology to be able to find some new uh, control measures. Okay. So for the first one, uh, as usual, you sort of start where you are with what you have, and what we had were two important um, uh, pieces of information. The first was this uh, DNA marker, and this is a mitochondrial gene that somebody has already introduced uh, called Cytochrome B that's been used for phylogenetic uh, inference of different uh, groups of potato cyst <laughs> Um And it's been used to show a few things. One, that this UK Globular Pallida uh, is very similar to the South American population. Uh, from over here, and so really not too far away from where we are. It's also been used to show that uh, in the UK we have at least three different sort of different populations or groups of, of global Europe palette, uh, <coughs> at least three, and, and, and probably only one of, of Rostockiensis. So that's the first piece of information, a DNA marker. The second um, uh, thing we had was this national DNA collection. 
And this was produced by SASA, the, the Scottish government, essentially, because they carry out these annual uh, pre-plant tests of potato growing fields all across Scotland. And what they do is they uh, take a W-shaped transect across the field, and they collect cores along that way, and then they, uh, they do about between 80 and 300 cores, and it's quite superficial, it's nothing like what, um, uh, what was already described. And then they pool all these samples, um, uh, collect anything that um, floats and extract DNA from, from, from the cysts that float from that soil using this sort of automated uh, carousel. They then do sort of tests on uh, which um, uh, kinds of potato cyst nematodes are there, and they store the DNA <coughs> in the freezer. So we had this bank of DNA from all the different fields across, or lots of different fields across Scotland, um, that goes back for a, for a number of years. So the idea was, um, could we combine these two pieces of information? Could we take this DNA marker uh, and this national DNA collection um, in sort of a proof of concept and say, could we type these 1,000 or so samples uh, in a single experiment and say which different populations of, of, of the nematode do we have in which field and in, in relative what abundance. And so to cut a long story short, I won't go into the methods uh, in very much detail, but we designed uh, some PCR primers that would be descriptive of the different types of palata that we knew about. Uh, we PCR these up, from uh, we amplified them from all the different samples, and each one was given a unique barcode. Uh, we then pulled them all, sequenced them, uh, and then uh, pulled them back out apart again based on these barcodes, and then uh, analyzed the data. Okay, so the first thing we wanted to know when we got these sequences back was that uh, did it work. Um, and if we looked at the top 50 most abundant sequences that we got back, um, they grouped into the three different types that we already knew about. So this was a nice sort of sanity check. Uh, with one exception, there was one um, sequence variant, sequence number seven, that we didn't know uh, existed before, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. And the second um, sort of sanity check was we also included some samples where we knew already what the mix of different populations were. And so these could be in these three different types, either 10% sort of, of type one and 90% of type two. Um, and then we would see whether the, the sequences we got back reflected the same ratio of the, the nematodes in the original sample. Uh, we did this for um, different mixes, so 10%, 90%, 25%, 75%, etc. Um, and, and the sort of take-home message is, um, uh, yes, uh, it worked. The, the ratio of sequences that we got back was a faithful representation of the different ratios of nematodes we had in, in, in the field samples. And we could do this for quite complex mixes of three different types, um, and everything seemed to be working quite well. So the answer was, did it work? Uh, yes, it did. So then we could go on to, to, to analyze the data. So the way I'm going to do this is I will start uh, zoomed out as far as we can to the country, and then I'll slowly zoom into different scales. Um, so this is a, a map of Scotland. Um, we found that most fields contained only one of these different populations of pallida. About 20% of the fields contained at least two different populations, and about 3% contained all three uh, populations. And we could mark you know, with really high accuracy where these populations were across the, the country. We zoom into the, the mixed fields, we could plot the relative abundance of sort of each type in each field. Um, and this is what I really liked about this experiment because uh, imagine if this was a marker not just for a different population, but for something which was important to do with the biology. So either a nematicide resistance or a virulence characteristic on a particular resistant variety. Then you could say that this farmer here has got type one and type two, type blue and type red, and so they should use control measure green. This one here has got type green and type red, so they should use control measure blue. And of course, then this one uh, down here has got three types so that they uh, should grow something else. We can then zoom into uh, each individual field, and this uh, work came from Eric Anderson, who um, basically went to one mixed field and then he took a grid sample every sort of five or ten meters across the uh, entire portion of that field, and he kept each one of the samples separately, and we treated them separately in our experiment. And then what we could do is plot the different diversity of, um, of, of pallida uh, across that field. And what it shows is this uh, sort of lamp-shaped diversity. Um, and I think if you, if you imagine uh, this sort of landscape is dominated by hotspots of different types, so different populations. So if you imagine walking from the back of the field to the front on this edge, you start with 100% of this type one. You go a little bit further down and you get 100% of type uh, three. You go five meters further, you get 100% type two. You go five meters further again, you get 100% type three. So you get this switching of uh, these different um, populations uh, as you as you walk across the field. We can then zoom in to another scale, which is down to the individual cyst. 
and we included 22 individual cysts. Uh, we found that most of them contained only one type, but there was this one cyst, uh, uh, cyst 22, that seemed to have a mixture of different uh, types within it. And so this, we think, is more support in favor of these uh, sort of hybrid uh, cysts. Okay, so the take home message from this part, and our sort of conclusions really, is we've demonstrated this proof of principle. Yes, it's possible that we can, we can genotype um, uh, lots of different uh, samples at the same time, and we could be quantitative, roughly quantitative, about which different populations of this nematode we have where. We can address lots of questions simultaneously, so diversity at the scale of the, field, uh, the country, the field, and, and the individual. Uh, and we can, we can definitely expand beyond a thousand fields. So, in fact, um, one of the problems we had with this experiment was we had almost too few samples, and it would have been easier if we did more, not, not less. Okay, so that uh, covers the sort of first half of the talk, sort of trying to understand what's the current state of play in the UK. And the second half uh, is this uh, search for new control methods. Now, this sort of started um, with sort of uh, a thought experiment on some of the fundamental biology of, uh, of uh, potato cyst nematode. And so we knew, of course, that these nematodes produce proteins that they put into the plant during infection, and this is what helps them cause disease. And so um, we know that these are produced in different gland cells, uh, and uh, sort of conceptually, if you like, we regard these gland cells as sort of the toolbox uh, that the nematode uses for infection. And so we reason that if this toolbox is so important for the nematode to infect the plant, if we can find out how the nematode uh, controls this toolbox, and we can disrupt that controlling mechanism, then we can disrupt all the tools into sort of one and tell swoop. So that was the idea. And so as part of a very large... Oh. No! <laughs> so shall I continue without slides? <laughs> I probably could do it from memory. Yeah? Yeah? yeah. Sure. Okay. Maybe I'll open the door. <laughs> okay, am I just a strange silhouette or is yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you shadow puppets or something? <laughs> okay, so um so as part of this large genome sequencing consortium, we wanted to try to find out how does the, the nematode regulate this production of effectors. Um, and these production of these proteins that they put into the plant. And so we did a really simple experiment. We just identified, you know, I'll continue anyway, just for time. <laughs> we, we identified all of the genes that we knew were expressed in one of these gland cells, and we simply compared their promoters to a number of genes that we knew were not expressed in those gland cells. And we carried out this comparison um, of these two DNA sequences, and uh, we found that there was this one DNA sequence that was enriched in uh, the promoters of the genes expressed in the gland cells and very highly enriched. And this sequence was an ATG CCA. It was just six base pairs, very short motif. And it was present in almost all of the genes that we knew were specifically expressed in that gland cell. And it was absent from most of the genes that we knew were absent in that gland cell. And so this looked like a sort of regulatory motif of, of this tissue. Um, and so then um, we sort of characterized a little bit of information about where this motif was, was, was present in the promoter regions. Um, and it seemed to be present in a specific location. So it wasn't just sort of randomly upstream of these promoter regions, it was always in a specific location, about 150 base pairs uh, upstream of the start site. And it always seemed to peak on, on actually both strands, it didn't seem to matter which strand was on. So we thought this looked pretty promising as a, as a potential regulatory motif uh, in these promoter regions, and so uh, we called this uh, the, the dog box. Now, um, when we first came up with this name, we thought this was a great name, because it was quite catchy, dog box, sounds great. Um, but then, uh, a couple of years later, okay, I'll continue. So this is the dog box. <laughs> and so then a couple of years later, um, we, we uh, regretted this quite badly, because uh, it was very, not, no one is specifically on there enough. So once we found this promoter motif, um, we could, uh, what was quite useful about it is we could go back to the rest of the genome, and we could say, show us all the other genes that also have copies of this dog box in a promoter region. And the first thing we noticed was there were many. There were many genes that had lots of copies of this motif um, in their promoter region uh, than we would expect to occur by random. So that was one uh, sort of observation. But what was quite important about this is the more copies of the promoter region and that it had, uh, the more copies of this motif in their promoter region, the more likely the corresponding gene um, had a signal effect of the secretion. And this is sort of one of these necessary features of a protein being delivered into the plant. 
And then to cut a long story short, if we just looked at this um, top group of, of genes that had lots of copies of the promoted region, we found that many of them were indeed uh, uh, expressed in that cancer. And so we really think we had a regulatory uh, motif associated with the, with the dorsal cancer. And so this kind of had two uh, interesting implications. The first one was that it sort of opened this toolbox. So we could now look inside and see what other different proteins that the nematode uses to manipulate the plant. And this was sort of interesting for me as somebody who works on the, the basic biology of the system. I won't talk anything about that because I think what's more important uh, from a, a future control point of view is that the presence of this motif implies the existence of a, a, a reader. So the idea here is if you have a uh, um, this motif that we identified was non-coding, okay? So we sort of reasoned that it has to be there for a reason, it must be doing something. Um, and the fact that it unifies uh, about 200 genes that are all expressed in the same tissue, we uh, sort of think that this implies there must be something that can recognize this motif and sort of orchestrate the expression of the genes in that tissue. And so we had this idea of this sort of spatial reader or regulator that conceptually um, links hundreds of genes that are all expressed uh, in the same tissue. And so the, the best way I have to describe this is it's like the, the conductor of an orchestra. Because the conductor uh, sort of themselves doesn't make any noise, but they're responsible for the concerted action of a number of independent parts in a sort of complex system. And if you had to disrupt an orchestra in a sort of cheapest and most efficient way possible, then going after the conductor is like a really nice way to, to, to start. So we thought this was important to try to find Surely not. We thought this was uh, important to try to find this uh, this reader, and so um, uh, uh, we, 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 we try to identify it. Uh, this is the search on the reader. Uh, and I won't go into detail of this because it looks like I'm running out of time, but we had a, a yeast one hybrid library in the lab from an unrelated project, and we basically took a piece of DNA that had this uh, dog box inside, and we screened this library, and we identified a transcription factor, one transcription factor. Um, actually a piece of a transcription factor. We cloned the full length transcription factor and we could um, uh, validate that it, it, it binds this, uh, this motif um, and it's sequence specific. So if we take this DNA, uh, piece of DNA, we remove the three dog boxes, but only the three dog boxes, then we completely abolish the interaction. And then finally, we wanted to just confirm this in one of the system. So to cut another long story short, we purify the protein of this transcription factor, which actually turned out to be remarkably easy. And then I realized this experiment, we took a piece of DNA that had these dog boxes on it, and we put a fluorescent molecule on the side. And when we run this on a gel, you get a band. And then we mix that with the protein of the transcription factor, um, and what happens is it runs much more slowly, and so uh, the band moves up. And then when you add in 100 times more DNA without any fluorescent molecule, um, you sort of push it back down. And so that confirmed the interaction. And then finally, we want to confirm the specificity and we did the same kind of competition assay, but either with uh, a normal dog box or a mutated dog box. Um, and again, that sort of confirmed both the interaction but also the specificity. And so where we are with this now is, uh, we think we have a pretty good candidate for this, this, this reader, uh, and we're working to try to knock it out during infection to see what happens to the nematode. Okay, um, and then I'd, I had one more slide uh, just to sort of show where we are with this kind of approach. Um, this is, of course, in the potato cyst nematodes, we have the dog box, and this is for the dorsal plant that That's what it looks like. Recently, we uh, applied the same logic to uh, root knot nematodes, and I, I want to show the motif here that we identified one that also does the dorsal plant only. It's a different motif to this one, and this is, here it has the problem with the name, so we just called this one my dog box. And then uh, we also identified uh, a third one in the pine wilt nematode um, that's dorsal and subventral glands, and luckily this one motif is already start our board, so we just we just kept that name. Um, and so we're trying to expand this same kind of logic into lots of different native species. Okay, so that leaves me just to say thank you very much to a lot of collaborators and friends that are involved in all this work over the last few years. Um, my funny body has been very kind over the last few years, um, very particularly very recently. Uh, and I thank all of you for, for listening and putting up with the, the power issue. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so the, sure. So the question was, we're trying to knock out this reader to see what happens to the nematode because we think it should be really important. Uh, so how are we trying to do that? So to test whether or not it's important, we'll use RNA interference. Um, so we'll be making um, 
probably transgenic what we are. I mean, we've, we've, made, we've made transgenic potato okay. um, that targets this uh, reader, um, but they're currently just being bulked up and in the fridge. So they're going through their dormancy and they'll be tested uh, okay. next season. Um, how would we do it in reality if, if it turns out to be useful? Yeah. Um, probably not with a transgenic plant because certainly in the UK this is really not attractive. Um, in fact, you can't, you couldn't grow a transgenic plant in the UK. Um, and so there's a number of other ways we could explore how to identify chemicals uh, that would block this transcription factor. Um, and so once we've proven that it works with the RNA interference, this is what will be the next. Step. Well, the only thing literally limiting the, I think, um, industry is to find a proper delivery way of uh, in, um, interrupt like uh, miRNA. So I think if we find a good candidate, then it, it's just finding the, the method. It's true. So there's there are other ways to deliver RNA to nematodes. It doesn't have to be transgenic. Yeah. Um, right. But we could explore that. Good luck. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay.